Good morning, everyone. It is February 18th, Saturday. Welcome to this morning's Morning Hair. Uh, it's late edition because I slept late for the first time in forever. But interestingly enough, I woke up with the perfect hair because it's story day. <sighs> story day. And I'm going to tell you one of my favorite stories. Um, in fact, I may read parts of it because I actually cared so much for the story. I wrote it down. Um, first of all, I show off my vintage Dungeons & Dragons t-shirt. <sighs> yeah, a little inappropriate. So anyway. Scouting. Girl Scout cookies are coming up. Now, of course, I was not in the Girl Scouts. I was in the Boy Scouts. And the Boy Scouts don't sell cookies. We steal them. But here's the story. Scouting, an American tradition. Um, hmm. The Boy Scouts. I know that's a fragment, but since fragments remind me of a rope that needs tying, and everything that I learned about rope tying, I learned in the Boy Scouts. There aren't as many Boy Scout troops in Tennessee as there once were, and that's sadly surprising for such a red state. But I see them everywhere up here in Connecticut, which is great. I, I have a son, and there's no place I'd rather see him suffer through the life's mysteries than in the Boy Scouts. I was in the Scouts for five and a half years, but never advanced beyond second class. I wasn't interested in all that merit badge stuff. I just like hiking and camping. It seems that today you never hear about the Boy Scouts unless there's some horrible revelation about a scout leader, but not in my childhood. The only disreputable scout leader we had was Mr. Ragsdale. He stole all our tents and equipments, but before that, he taught us how to tie a Palomar knot, which has, has saved me more fish in the long run than the cost of seven secondhand army tents. He also taught us how to bake potatoes at a fire and some wonderful curse words we'd never heard before. Okay, the last part I'm not too proud of, but at least one of the guys in my troop went to Hollywood and became a scriptwriter, so his mastery of profanity became a marketable skill, a skill which he wouldn't have learned if not for the Boy Scouts. But the greatest gift Mr. Ragsdale gave us was the knowledge of justice. Uh, Clarence Darrow once said, there is no justice in or out of court. He was wrong. Justice lives. My favorite scouting memory was from 1967. Mr. Ragsdale took us to Mammoth Cave in Kentucky. I think there were 16 guys in my troop, but the weekend, that weekend we were joined by a dozen other troops from Tennessee and Kentucky. There must have been 200 scouts, and they gave us a tour of the cave. Our guide was a young fellow named Mr. Wilcox. He showed us the remains of a poor Native American who had been crushed by a stone hundreds of years before. We call him Lost John, joked young Mr. Wilcox. We've enclosed his skeleton in glass, but he remains our top exhibit. Everybody wants to see the dead Indian. Mr. Ragsdale was ashamed of the treatment of this young explorer who died alone in the dark so long ago. After the tour commenced, he and my brothers, me and my bro he and my brothers stared at the display for long moments as the glass reflected two sad, reverential faces. It ain't right, boys, Mr. Ragsdale said later as we crawled through mud and squeezed between continent-sized slabs of rock. Any more than if you or I was to be killed in this here cave. That young Indian needs a proper burial. He don't need to be in a glass case for us to stare at. It just ain't right, and these things have a way of evening out. We think Lost John serves an important function, smirked young Mr. Wilcox. He's a piece of history, frozen time. We gave him a proper service. It ain't right, repeated Mr. Ragsdale. I'm sorry I brung these boys to see it. That night, the park service allowed all 200 of us to spend the evening inside the cave. We rolled out our sleeping bags in a clay, gray clay and settled in as best we could. In our foolishness, we asked for a ghost story. Young Mr. Wilcox gave us one and it remains the most terrifying tale I had ever heard or ever will hear. It was about a boy, our age, who became separated from the others of his group and wandered the cave, not knowing how long he'd been lost, for how could he know without the setting of the sun and moon? He lived on bats and spring waters, and as the long years rushed by, his skin became translucent, his eyes grew to the size of dinner plates, and he forgot how to talk, and he wandered the catacombs looking for someone. But on those rare occasions when he saw a light in the distance, it hurt his monstrous eyes, so accustomed to the dark they were. So the translucent kid waited in the dark, waiting for someone to get close, to stagger near, so he could grab him with his frightful hands. Okay, boys, says smiling young Mr. Wilcox. Here she goes, story. Go to sleep. Like we could. Then he turned the lights out. It was dark. Not heard the word dark used before, but until I was in a cave, I didn't really know the meaning of dark. This was a dark that didn't get better. This was the dark of death. This was the terrible dark the translucent kid wandered around in, the dark that swallowed Lost John, the murderous primordial dark. I can't see! I can't see! I screamed. Shut up, you idiot, spat my brother. You're in a cave. It's supposed to be this dark. I could hear movement. My brother was doing something, but I couldn't tell what. 
Then I heard him grunt, I heard the swish of a cotton sleeve, and then, far away in the dark, a shriek of surprise and muttering curses. That night, in the dark of Mammoth Cave, the game of blind-throwing cave floor clay was invented. There was only one rule. Don't, under any circumstances, turn on your flashlight. That would make you a target. The game went on for perhaps 30 minutes before young Mr. Wilcox threw the giant breaker and flooded the area with light. We shrank from the sudden illumination covered in clay and guilt. What's going on here? demanded young Mr. Wilcox. I want you boys to go to sleep. I'm going to cut this light out and, and, and... He realized his mistake, but it was too late. Our eyes adjusted to the harsh white light, and each of us, 200 scouts and one righteous scout leader, possessed a clay ball and a focused aim, and now a target. When young Mr. Wilcox cut the light off, the air sizzled with a furious barrage and one passionate scream several octaves lower than a typical Boy Scouts. This here's for lost, John! Mr. Ragsdale took us home the next day and was got with our tents the following weekend. We didn't care. Lost John was removed in 1976 when a federal law was passed that prohibited the display of Native American remains. He was buried in a secret location. I don't know if they ever found Mr. Ragsdale, but I hope he got away. Some lessons can't be learned in school. I never saw young Mr. Wilcox again either, but my older brother assured him, assured me the translucent kid probably got him. A happy story with a moral. Um, you can find that and other stories in this delightful book. Don't mind me. It's Tennessee and Lost in Connecticut. By, by, who's, that, who's, that, who's that by? Who's that by? Oh! <gasps> It's by me. You can buy it on Amazon. Perfect size for kids spiders. Okay, that's it for today. Uh, this hair is the... Um, I don't remember. The Boy Scout. Yeah, let's call it the Boy Scout. This is the Boy Scout hair. And so, what's the Boy Scout motto? Do a good deed daily. Go do something good. See you tomorrow. Bye.